Satan. So Matthew chapter 15 this evening, the Bible is about to highlight for us two very different forms of worship this evening. Uh, the first 28 verses of this chapter is going to bring out into the light two worships that are diametrically opposed the one from the other. I'm just going to read two verses of Scripture to start off with, but I wish you wouldn't close your Bibles on us because we'll preach down through these verses tonight. Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 9. If you found your place with me, say amen. Amen. Jesus said, speaking of the scribes and the Pharisees, but in vain they do worship me. The word vain in the text literally means fruitless, pointless. It means when you add it all up, it comes out to a big goose egg. When you add up what they're doing, it's a zero, it's a blank. God looked at it and said, it means absolutely nothing to me. He said, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Come all the way down to verse number 28, and we find our word again, and the second form of worship tonight is not that of the scribes and the Pharisees, but in the text it is this little Gentile Syrophoenician woman. And the Bible says in verse number, excuse me, not verse 28, look down at verse number 25. Verse 25 said this, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. I want to preach tonight on the right kind of worship. The right kind of worship. Here in the Bible, the Lord and the Scriptures highlights for us that there's two different groups of people that are worshiping. But both of them aren't right tonight. I know we live in a day that is accepting of anything and everything and anybody and everybody tonight. I know we live in a day where when you criticize somebody's form of worship, somebody's form of religion, or somebody's idea on something, you just can't do that because everybody is entitled to their opinion and everybody can do what they want to do tonight. I realize we live in a day where to say this worship is right and this worship is wrong, you are branded narrow-minded, you are branded legalistic, uh, you are branded uh, uh, uncaring and unkind and uncouth, but the truth truth is tonight there is a right way to worship God and there's a wrong way to worship God tonight. The truth is there is still right, there is still wrong, there is still good, there is still evil. The Lord's a very plain kind of individual tonight. He's not nearly as gray in the areas as we are. The Lord is very white and He's very black. He, he, he's very cut and dry and to the point tonight. We, we don't understand nothing about that in America no more. We can't even figure out what genders we are. We can't even figure out out of two genders anymore. We can't even figure out that it's just male and it's just female. Now there's homosexual, lesbian, and gay, and bisexual, and transgender, and non-binary, and who in the world knows what else is out there. Now, I mean, you just don't ever know what's floating around anymore, man. I mean, there, there's no cut and dry things. There's now, they come out with these things now, and you hear liberals say, that they say, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. Well, I'm sad to tell y'all tonight, they're not your truth and my truth and their truth. There's just truth tonight. Truth, truth, truth is not dependent on who it is speaking it. Truth is just truth regardless of who speaks it tonight. And Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth tonight. Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth. No man come to the Father but by me. There's just truth tonight. And if what you believe doesn't line up with the truth, then I'm sorry to tell you, I really am not, but I'm trying to make it, you know, a spoonful of sugar help the medicine go down. I'm sorry to tell you tonight, you're wrong, and the book is right tonight. And here the Bible is about to give us two different forms of worship. One is right, and one is wrong tonight. You say, why is that? Well, because one is self-righteous, and one is is selfless. One form of worship is self-centered. It's all about them. And the other one is Savior-centered. It's all about Him. 
What, what, what worship tonight draws the Lord's anger. It draws his frustration to the point of reproof and rebuke. But the other one draws the Lord's approval to the point that he steps out of a dispensational line, gives the Gentile dog what she wants, and then steps back over. God looked at one worship and said, it means absolutely nothing. It's a zero. On the other one, God stepped out of what he had just said that he wasn't even sent to them Gentiles. He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and he said you know what I know where I'm at and I know what Dr. Bottle Stopper and Dr. Snazel Bridges said about dispensations but I'm God and I can step around anywhere I want to and I'm going to step outside of where I'm supposed to be for a minute help this woman and step back in and that's a real worship right there friend I mean a worship that gets God out of the box that he already said he was in was it not Jesus that said in the text, I'm not sure but the lost sheep of the house of Israel, was it not Jesus that told his apostles, Brother Daniel, don't even go into the way of the Gentiles. Don't even mess with them. And yet when a Gentile comes needing something, she has such a worship that is so powerful <laughs> that she gets what she needs. I want that kind of worship. Y'all don't know about you, but if I'm going to worship God, and I believe we are to, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise you the Lord. I believe worship is not just an option. I believe it is a commandment. God is who He is, and God has been good to us, so we in turn should worship Him tonight. And real fast, let me say this while I'm, while I'm moving at a rapid pace at the beginning here. Let me just say this real fast. There ain't no such thing. There ain't no such thing. That's, that's good English for there is no such thing there ain't no such thing as emotionless worship I would challenge you to take that King James Bible those 66 books and show me somewhere where somebody worshipped or praised God and it didn't jump out somewhere there is no such thing there is no such thing as modern day Baptist theology of well I worship God inwardly ain't no such thing in the Bible I'm sorry but ain't no such I know it sounds spiritual but it ain't spiritual tonight when worship starts you may not do it like me you may not do it like preacher Foster or somebody else like this cat over here that's hollering and screaming I like this guy I'm going to take you home with me praise God you may not do it like the rest of us but I'm telling you when worship starts something will happen there will be a voice come out a tear come down a hand go up an amen there will be something that happens on the outside to let somebody else know you are are worshiping God here I find one worships right one worships wrong here just to highlight just for a minute these wrong worshipers and I'm not going to spend much time on them because I have found out that if you really want to get to what's true you ain't got to wade through the error a whole lot just focus on the truth Amen. They say even people that deal and, and look at counterfeit money and can spot it, they don't study counterfeit money to be able to figure out what the counterfeit money is. They study the real money so they know what it is when they see it. So we're going to study the real thing tonight. But just to bump the counterfeit, can I say this about them? It, it is interesting. It is interesting to me tonight uh, that, that, Brother Jackson, we find that at the beginning of this story, at the beginning, just from the outside looking in, the wrong kind of worship looks right and the right kind of worship looks wrong the proof was in the pudding when it got to the end <laughs> the proof was in the pudding when Jesus started talking about both worships tonight here we find the wrong kind of worship in the text they had some things right they had the right heritage well, they got the right heritage. The Bible says in verse number 1 of chapter 15, it said there were scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem. And they said to the, why did thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? These guys have got heritage on their side tonight. These are full-blooded children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They can trace their lineage back to the 12 tribes. Brother, they've got the right heritage tonight, and they're proud of it. They got all their traditions right. They got the I's dotted. They got their T's crossed. I mean, brother, these cats right here, they can quote the first five books of the Old Testament 
it from memory. They fast twice in a week. They pay tithes of everything they got. They go to the temple on the Sabbath day. Brother, they got, I mean, from the outside, they got it all down pat. But when it comes to such a simple task, such a basic childlike task of worshiping God, God says, you can't even do this right. You, you, miss, you, you can't even do this sub basic thing of worship right. You got fasting right, and you praying, and you go into the house of God, and you got, but you can't even worship right. What's up with this? Heritage is right. Can I say their hands are right? That's what they're giving the disciples trouble for in the text. They're giving them trouble because they got dirty hands when eating. They're giving them trouble because they said you're eating with unwashing hands. You ain't doved up. You ain't dawned up. You know this COVID thing got everybody so scared to death about. You know we need hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. Lord have mercy. We've hand sanitized up now. We've killed the good germs, brother. I mean we ain't got no germ left. They're all gone. They, 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 they get their hands all right. When you looked at their hands, son, they were squeaky clean. Wasn't no dirt under their fingernails. On the outside, their hands look good. But the problem with their worship was not the fact that their hands wasn't right. The fact and the problem with their worship was their heart was not right tonight. You want to know what Jesus says about it? Look what Jesus says down here in verse number uh, in verse number 8. Look at verse number 8. It said this. Jesus said, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, honoreth me with their lips. Their hands are right. The outside's right. But their heart is far from me. Look at what's in their heart. Verse 18, verse 18, 19. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man to eat with unwashing hands. Defileth not the man. Here we find they look good on the outside but they are matched up from the floor up on the inside tonight. You see, real worship, real worship doesn't care who's watching. That's the only reason they did their worship. They want to know who's watching. Y'all, let, let me, let, can I just pause right here and say this real fast before I dive off into the rest of the message? If the only kind of worship you got, sister, if the only kind of worship you got, brother, is a worship that happens at Emmanuel Baptist Church when everybody's in here, you got the wrong kind of worship. Say, what well, you talking about, preacher? I mean, if you ain't got to walk with God that every once in a while while you riding down the road and listen to the right kind of music, that's why some of y'all can't worship except when you're at the church. You don't even listen to the right stuff till you get to church. Hard to worship when you listen to Leonard Skinner, ACDC, and the Eagles. Hard to worship when you listen to J-Lo and Christine Aguilera, if they even the thing anymore. Hard to worship when you listen to Miley Cyrus. Hard to worship when you... It's hard to worship God when you listen to that junk. I tell you, a real worship, a real worship ought to work when you're going down the road by yourself and some preaching comes through the radio or singing comes through the radio and about that time God sits down and nobody's looking and nobody's watching but just you and the God that saved you and out of a spontaneous reaction because you love Him and you know He loves you, by yourself a hand goes up and a tear runs down. That's something real in the heart tonight. I like corporate worship. I'm for corporate worship. Watch our church services. We believe in it, but I also believe in private worship too. Yeah, here we find their hands are right, their heritage is right, but their heart's wrong tonight. But tonight I want to look at the right worshiper. The right worshiper. She, she, starts, she comes into focus in verse 21 and verse 22. The Bible said this is just a woman of Canaan. She got a need. She's got a burden. And, and this poor old gal right here, Brother Daniel, she ain't got the right heritage. <laughs> she, she can't trace her lineage back. She's a Heinz 57 mutt of a dog. Gentile dog, Jesus calls her that. Per Jesus Christ, not Cody's horn. I mean, this woman, she can't trace no lineage back. She can't trace no heritage back. She ain't got it all together. Brother, her heritage ain't right. Look here, I doubt her hands are even right. She probably got dirt on her hands. She probably got dirt under her fingernails. She ain't got all the eyes dotted. She ain't got all the T's crossed. And on top of that, on top of that, just for good, just for ever good, independent, fundamental, premium, little King James Bible, even macho Baptist male, she's a woman too. Yeah. God forbid that a woman would teach the men how to worship. <laughs> Boy, locked meeting up right yonder, didn't we? 
I'm sorry to tell you Rambo but in the text the men all had it wrong including the apostles the old Gentile woman that didn't have the right heritage didn't have the right hands but she, she's got the right heart now I want to stop right there real fast let me qualify unless somebody calls me a liberal let me stop right there and say this I do believe you ought to have both right I ain't no contemporary CCM, you know, contemporary Christian music movement. If I was going to be CC something, it'd be CCR. Praise God, Clean Square Water Revivals, where I'd join up with. If I was going to be one, it sure won't be contemporary Christian music. It'd be Clean Square Water. That's a real revival. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, better than what they got going on. I do believe you ought to have the outside right and the inside right. Jesus doesn't upbraid the Pharisees because they're keeping the outside right. He upbraids them because they're keeping the outside right to the exclusion of the inside. Both ought to be right tonight. I believe you can keep both right tonight. And here's a woman that comes. She ain't got it all together, but she's worshiping correctly. I want to examine this woman just for a few minutes tonight. It's 8 o'clock. I'm going to give you just a few things here real quick, and we're going to go. The right kind of worship. What makes her worship Right, preacher Zorn. Well, what makes her right, number one, and firstly, and first and foremost, I ain't even going to try and put this one at the end. I'm putting it at the beginning because it's the main thing. Her worship has the right origins. <laughs> her worship originates in the right spot and with the right person. Say, so what do you mean by that? Watch what your text said. Verse number 22, the Bible said, Behold, verse 22, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me. Watch the next two words. I love this. Oh, Lord. Thou son of David, my daughter, is grievously vexed with the devil. Hey, I want you to notice something with me. She opens her mouth, Brother Jordan, she opens her mouth three times. She only talks three times in this text, y'all. Three times. And all three times, she puts the right person in the middle of her worship. She's going to open her mouth three times and watch what she does. All th see, see, the scribes and the Pharisees, every time they open their mouth in worship, they say, well, I thank God that I'm not like the rest of these people. I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I go to this church and I got this and I got that. And look here, they all may be good things, but when it comes to worship, your standards don't win place or show. We don't worship our standards tonight. And I believe in having standards. You want to know about my standards? Come ask me after church. I got a string long as my leg this evening. I got plenty of them. I got plenty of them. But when it's time to worship, I ain't worshiping what I do and what I don't do. I'm worshiping somebody tonight. Watch what your Bible said. Three times she opens her mouth. She's opened it in verse 22 and said, Oh, Lord. She opens her mouth again in verse 25. Verse 25. Then came she and worshiped him saying, Here it is again. Lord. Help me. She opens her mouth one more time. Verse 27. And she said, Truth. Here he is again. Lord, did you notice what's at the beginning, the middle, and the end of her worship? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, Lord, Lord. All three times she opens her mouth, she ain't touting her own goodness. She ain't touting her own righteousness. She ain't tooting her own horn. But all three times she opens her mouth, it's all about Him. It's all about Him. It's all about Him tonight. Can I say when it comes time to worship, it's not not about you it's not about me it's not about the preacher it's not about the singers it's about Jesus 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 tonight he ought to have the preeminent spot he ought to have the top spot he ought to have the highest spot and he should be exalted he should be praised he should be honored he should be worshiped he should be magnified he should be glorified he should be honored he should be looked at he ought to get all the worship tonight. Lord, forgive us this evening. I'm going to throw myself in with everybody. God, forgive us this evening for promoting personalities above Jesus. For promoting preachers, teachers, singers, promotions, programs, entertainment above Jesus. 
It ought not to be so. In all things, Paul said, he ought to have the preeminence. He is the head of the body, the church. He ought to get all the glory tonight. Lord, Lord, Lord. Bless, bless the poor old disciples' heart. Bless these poor old disciples' heart. I know that they, I know they was a Baptist preacher like Cody Zorn. You know how I know that? Because they tried to interject themselves in the worship. Look what your Bible said. Watch what your book said. I ain't making stuff up. Look at your book. Said she said, "Have mercy on me, O Lord. My daughter's grievously vexed with the devil." Verse twenty-three. But he answered her not a word. Check it out. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, "Send her away." Why? Check it. Don't miss it now. For she crieth after us. I hate to tell y'all this, Jack, but she ain't crying after every one of y'all. I didn't. I did not hear her invoke the name Peter. Have mercy on me. Didn't hear it. Wasn't in the book. Didn't hear her preacher invoke the name Sons of Thunder. James and John, have mercy on me. No, nope, didn't, didn't hear it. Didn't hear Thomas, Bartholomew, Thaddeus. Certainly didn't hear Judas. Didn't hear none of that. I'll tell you what I did hear. Sorry to, sorry to deflate the ego of the disciples, but she is not crying after y'all. She cries after us. No, 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 no. She don't cry after us. She cries after him. She cries after him. Can I tell y'all? Can I tell y'all this? Uh, I'll be honest with you. If there's one thing that pastoring has been a blessing to me, it's this. Uh, it's that every Sunday I stand up in front of people and I know what they're going through. And I know the burdens they're carrying. And I know the weights that's on them. And when they come to church, they're reaching out for something. They need something. They need a word from heaven. They need a touch from God. They need something in their soul. And you know what I realize? I can't give it to them. I am not educated enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not powerful enough. I can't give it to them. So you say, what do you try and do every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night that you stand up in front of them people? I try and get out the way as fast as I can and run them to Jesus. Run them to Jesus. Run them to Jesus. He's the one that can put a home back together. He's the one that can save a soul from hell. He's the one that can help them with the wayward change. Out. He's the one that can give him peace and joy. It's all about him tonight. I believe sometimes we have forgotten that. Real worship, the right kind of worship has the right origins. It's all about him. He was talking about I am a honored, proud, full-fledged, dipped out in the wool from here down to yonder, Georgia Bulldog fan. Glory. Y'all can shout a pipe if you want to. I'm going to preach just like, hey man, that's good stuff right there. That might be the holiest thing I say during this message. Praise God. That's the holy stuff you almost can't even talk about. It. Years ago, years ago, I took my wife and my two oldest daughters at the time. They was, they was littler back then, smaller. We took them to Athens, Georgia, to Sanford Stadium to go watch the dogs play. It was glorious. Uh, uh, we've been to many, many times after that. Uh, but that was the first time I ever took my girls. Man, they got all dolled up. and got the little G's on their cheeks, you know, and red G-bows in their hair. And we, they got a canes down there. I never seen canes till I started going to Athens. And then y'all got one up here. Y'all must be close to God. They got one over by the hotel too. I will eat there sometime this week before I go. I love that place. And, uh, and we got up in there, and it happened to be it was cold that night, real cold up there, and they was playing the university. Sorry to tell y'all, they was playing the University of Kentucky. They was. I think, I think they beat them like 55 to 3 or something like that. It was, it was great. It was, a, it was a wonderful game. Praise God. Anyways, we got up in there, and it was senior night that night. And on senior night, that's where they bring out all the, the fellas that's about to graduate. They call their name, their number, their stats, if they've got any, and what they've done for the team and the university. They get a picture with the coach, and then, you know, then they start the game after a big applause and all that. Well, this particular night, it was senior night for a quarterback we had way back then. His name was Aaron Murray. 
Number 11, Aaron Murray, come from the uh, Tampa High School, to the Plant City High School in Tampa, Florida. By the time that Aaron Murray left the University of Georgia, he was at that time, I think his records have been beaten now, but he was at that time the all-time SEC leader in passing yards and touchdowns. His way up there. We was right proud of the old boy. And, uh, and he was going to be the last one they was going to bring out, Brother Foster. And it, it, anticipation just kind of built. They brought out everybody else that kind of, some of these guys, I'd never even heard their names. I was like, who was that? Praise God. They didn't even play a snap for the dog. Lord, get that scrub out the way. We don't care who he is. Anyways, and it was about time for Mary to come out. And son, that thing just built and built and built. And about that time, over them loudspeakers, that fellow said, Now, introducing from the Plant High School in Tampa, Florida. He's the all-time SEC leader in passing yards and touchdowns. He's the captain of the Bulldog Nation. Let's hear it for Aaron Murray. And son, that place come unscrewed. 93,000 Bulldog fans went nuts, and I did too. Right smack dab in the middle of them. Had myself a big old time. And while that boy was trotting out on the field, here's this, here's this 21, 22 year old kid trotting out on the field, and everybody's just coming unglued because of what he's done and who he is. And I thought to myself, preacher, shouldn't that be the way it is every Sunday morning when the church gathers at the house of God? Somebody ought to remind the church he didn't die yesterday. He not still on the cross. Somebody ought to grab a microphone, sing a song, preach a message or something and say, now, now introducing from the glory world. He's the one which was from old. He's the one which was from everlasting. He's the almighty God. He's the everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Rose of Sharon. He's the Lily of the Valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the Alpha and He's the Omega. He's the beginning. He's the ending. He's the first. He's the last. He's the almighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, that's who He is tonight. And brother, when it comes to worship, he should get the highest spot in the church tonight. I say not only is her, the, the right kind of worship has the right origin, it not only has the right origin, but can I say this, the right kind of worship can worship on the right occasion. It worships even on the right occasion. I say it's the right occasion, but for most of us, this is the wrong occasion to worship. Watch what your Bible said. Verse 22 said, this is, this is her request. She wants mercy because her daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Verse 23 said, Jesus didn't answer her. Verse 24 said, He didn't come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, don't miss it. That's the, the lead up to verse 25. Verse 25, Then came she and worshiped him the problem has not been solved when she comes to worship the issue is not fixed when she worships do y'all know what she's left at the house some of y'all sitting here thinking oh it ain't that big a deal what she's left at the house she got a daughter to give her the vex with the devil yeah but did you read in the book of Mark what it was like for a child in this day to be grievously vexed with the devil for a child in this day to be grievously vexed with the devil, the Bible said there was a father that came to Jesus with a son that was in the same shape as this little girl here. And the Bible said the father looked at Jesus and said, it has oftentimes cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. The Bible said that little boy fell on the ground and wallowed foaming as the spirit tore at his inside to the outside. This mother has left the scene at the house that is unimaginable to everybody in the building. This mother has literally watched as her and her daughter would be sitting by the fireside only out of nowhere that daughter to be cast into the hearth of the fireplace. This mother have to reach in and grab the singeing body of her little girl and pull it out as the fire burns her face and burns her hair and then try and fix her daughter and put holes and aloes on her body. She has literally watched as her daughter has been cast off into streams and lakes and rivers and the devil try and drown her she has to drag her daughter out that's what she's left at the house and the problem has not been fixed she comes to the Lord the problem is not fixed the situation has not been changed and she comes and worships him 
God, I'm going to give you worship even though my situation, <laughs> even though my situation has not changed, even though my heart is broken, even though my daughter is still messed up, you are still worthy of my praise. You are still worthy of my worship. You see, the right kind of worship, the right kind of worship can work when everything has gone to hell in a handbasket. You see, the, a lot of people got this idea. A lot of people got this idea. Well, as long as I got money in my pocket, food in my cabinet, health in my body, a good job, and everything's going good, then I'll come in and worship God. That ain't real worship. Real worship can worship God when the devil has put up a pup tent on your back doorstep and is goading you the whole time. Can you all imagine her walk to the Savior from wherever it was she left out of these coasts of Tyre and Sidon and she comes walking to the Lord and the devil's walking around next to her and saying, you a fool, you a fool. Your daughter's at the house and I got her and I'm not letting go. Don't you see what all's going on in your life? It's a mess. It's a flat-footed mess and I've got it and it ain't going to change. But listen to me. That little woman said, I don't care what you say. No Nothing's going to stop me from getting to Him and worshiping. Nothing's going to stop me from getting at His feet. And tonight, there's some of y'all tonight that you've left, some, you've left some situations at the house that the rest of us can't even imagine. You've been fighting hell by the half acre for the last several days or weeks or months and some of us can't even imagine. But tonight, you've drug yourself to the house of God. You've raised a glad hand while they've been singing. You've lifted your voice toward heaven. And I promise you, there's a God in heaven that he takes notice of it he hears it he knows it and he desires worship even in the darkest hours of life tonight do not let the devil steal your worship that's what he's tr he's trying to steal her worship say so how did he try and steal it he's using her daughter can I tell you, the devil has absolutely no cooth. The devil has absolutely no sympathy. And sir, ma'am, he'll use whatever he can to try and rob you of your worship. Say, so why would he try and rob me of that? Because he knows you need it real bad. You see, worship ain't... See, I think sometimes we think worship's just for God. It ain't. I believe when God's people start worshiping, there's a transaction that goes on. Not only are we sending glory His way, but when we worship God, sending something back our way to help us. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you tonight, there's a balm in worship that you can't get nowhere else. There's a balm in lifting glad hands. There's an all in giving God glory. And there's something holy about worshiping God. When the devil says don't, when your flesh says don't, there's something holy about that tonight. Something God likes about that, friend. I will never forget one of the holiest to this day. To this day. I will never forget as long as I live. To this day, Preacher Waters, the holiest hour of worship that I ever engaged in with God was not in a church. Sorry to tell you. I know that messed up your theology, but it weren't. It wasn't at a meeting I was preaching. Oh, no. It wasn't where the singers was there singing. Oh, no, 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 no. The holiest hour of worship, Brother Foster, that I ever had was in, forgive me for this, the All Faiths Chapel at the St. Joseph's Candler Memorial Hospital in Savannah, Georgia. Y'all know them little chapels I'm talking about? That means if you've been in them, that means you've been hurting before. Because don't nobody go in them things unless they really got to. They awful. They for everything and everybody. You walk in there, and you know they got menorahs over there for the Jews. They got stuff over there for Islam. They got stuff for Protestants and all. I mean, they just got something for everybody. It's where all the kooks and the wackos go. But on that particular day in 2012, my son was having a tumor cut out the size of my fist that was cancerous and staring down the barrel of at least six months of chemotherapy, which he ended up having. And brother, on that day, when we sat in the waiting room uh, in the St. Joseph's County Memorial Hospital, I didn't know what to do. That several-hour surgery was taking place. The doctors had already told us, Brother Foster, when they took it out, it may not stay together. They said, we're just letting you know right up front, that tumor, we don't know if it's solid. It, on the way out, it could fall 
fall apart, and if it does, it's going to send cancer cells scattering throughout his entire body. It can be very dangerous. This is what we, we don't know what's going on. We're sitting there with our family. My wife's tore up. How am I supposed to help her? What am I, what you going? What you going to do a time like that? What you going to tell her? Romans eight twenty eight. God bless you, doctor. Try that in some time on somebody's hurting. What are you, 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 you going to tell her? What are you going to tell her? My Bible verse fixing to change the whole thing? I love that book. That book's got me through on many times. But brother, on that occasion, she knew all the verses just like I did. She knew the passages. She, she needed to get to God. And so did I. I will never forget the holiest hour of our life. We walked into that little, that little room, that little all-face chapel, and we got up in that little altar and bore our soul and cried and prayed and cried and prayed. And I'll be honest, I didn't feel nothing. I'll never forget. Y'all forgive me for being this brutally honest. Y'all forgive me for this. I will never forget uttering these words to God. I uttered them out loud. I prayed them out loud. I said, God, where is this grace you promised? Because I do not feel it. I said, God, where is this grace? Peace you promised that passes all understanding. I need some now, Lord. I just don't feel it. I wasn't doing it in an irreverent way. I was broken. I needed some help. I would preached all that stuff. It's another thing to live that stuff. And about that time, my brother had been down in that altar with us praying. I didn't know what else to do. I looked at him, preacher, and I said, Chad, sing me a song. I need to hear a song. And my brother opened his mouth and started singing all them old songs that we grew up on. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Got to say, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Got to say, when peace like a river attendeth my way and sorrows like sea billows roll. And I'll never forget. They were somewhere in the middle of that singing that, brother, I, I plumb forgot about all of it. I'm telling you, there was a wind from another world blowed up in that place. And there was a hand went up this way. And my other hand went that way. And I audibilized this to the Lord. I said, Lord, win, lose, or draw. That boy was yours before he was mine. And God, I'm going to worship you just because of who you are. Just because you're the God of heaven and earth. You're the God of my salvation. I'm telling you, there was something holy in that hour of worship that you can't experience any other way. Real deep worship happens. When the occasion says, don't do it. When the occasion says, it's crazy to worship now. And you say, well, I'm crazy or not. He's worthy of it and I need it. So I'm holy about it, friend. I the right kind of worship. It had the right origins, had the right occasion. Can I say this? The right kind of worship e e even can worship and can take offense. Didn't just have the right origin, and it wasn't just the right occasion, but it took offense. It can take the offense. Say, what do you mean the offense? Watch what Jesus says to this woman. Verse 25, she worships him. And she pours her soul out, Lord, help me. Boy, that's, that's just a, a plea from a broken-hearted mother. Lord, help me. And watch how un- Cooth Jesus is. Jesus could not be America's pastor. Oh, no, 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 no. The, you, imagine Joel Osteen giving this to his congregation come Sunday morning. He wouldn't have to sell tickets again. He'd have to sell the building. Amen. Watch what he said, verse 26. He answered and said, this is his response to a broken-hearted mother. It is not meat to take the children's bread, y'all check it out, and to cast it to dogs. Oh, heaven forbid. Lord, have mercy. He just called her a slur. Y'all, I don't, I, don't I don't know what you're reading about your Bible. I don't know what you're reading about your Bible, but do you realize in that day to call a Gentile a dog by Jew, that was a racial slur? Is anybody else catching this? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus could not be America's pastor. Jesus, get up to preach. Look at somebody. Give them you a dog. And they say, I'm never coming back again. If Jesus is going to talk to me that way, I'll go find a church where they talk nice to me and I'm never coming back again. He offended me. God bless you. You ain't going to get what you need. 
She could have popped up, got offended, took off, and her daughter would have still been grievously vexed with the devil. Her need for help outweighs her little feelings on her shoulder. You know the problem with a lot, let me pause right here, the problem with a lot of people in Baptist churches across America, they obviously don't need something enough. Here, this woman needs something so bad, her worship takes an offense. Say, what's that got to do with worship? Oh, it's got everything to do with it. The right kind of worship? You notice what she says about this? She said in the next verse, she said, Truth, Lord. You telling it right, Rev? That's right, preacher. That's what I am. She agreed with him. You see the right kind of worship? It ain't just all, who glory, when the singing's going on. It's hallelujah, that's right, when the preaching's going on. Let me stop right here and say something for just a minute. I'm nervous of anybody in any crowd that while singing's going on, they're all hallelujah and glory to God, and that's wonderful, and going to the altar and this and that. And as soon as preaching starts... That ain't real worship. Real worship can take the truth. Real worship can take in your face truth when it's against you. Did you notice? Did you notice? I don't know if you noticed this. The wrong kind of worship can't. Would you back up with me? Look, I'm telling you the, I'm telling you the book, the gospel. Watch what it said. Look at what it said down here in verse number 12. Back it up to verse 12. Jesus just got done ripping the Pharisees. Give them the truth. Ripped them. Verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Jesus. Don't you know that crowd over there? You hurt their feelings. Tell you what, Jesus. You a modern day 2021 pastor. You've preached something that has irritated and aggravated the biggest tithers in your church. Jesus, you need to run after them and say, Oh, I'm so sorry. God bless you. I'm sorry. Let me pat your back. Let me pat your head. Let me. No, 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 no. And what Jesus done? Check it out what Jesus says, verse 13, 14. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Verse 14. Watch the first three words. Let them alone. You know what Jesus said about people that can't handle the truth, they're constantly getting offended and can't handle the truth? Leave them alone. Don't go run after them and beg them to come back. They'll just come back and get offended again. Can I give some admonition to every church member, not the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church or not? Can I give some admonition to every church member of Emmanuel Baptist Church? If the preaching of the Word of God and the handling of the work of God in this place, if somebody constantly gets offended by it, for goodness sake, for heaven's sake, for the church's sake, Stop running after them and trying to get them back. Stop running after them and say, Oh, we want you to come back. Why? So they can start more drama? Why? So they can come back and make another big scene? Let them alone. Ah! So I can't believe that. I thought everybody's important. No, the work of God's important. Amen. It's more than one person. Amen, amen, amen. That's right. Here Jesus said, let them alone. You find, you realize, I like this, I like this, Brother Daniel. There's only two people in the New Testament Jesus said to leave alone. Only two. Don't know that? Just two. And they're diametrically opposed one from the other. He said, leave the whiners alone. That's these folk right here, all the time whining. Leave the whiners alone. And then you go read the book of Mark, and there's a little woman that come to worship him. And she poured alabaster on his head, and they got to mocking her and getting mad at her, and Jesus said, leave her alone. There's two people you better leave alone tonight. You better leave the whiners alone, and you better leave the worshipers alone. <laughs> Brother, when somebody's worshiping God and Spirit and truth, you better keep your hands off of them, keep your mouth off of them, and let them worship God all they want tonight. See, see, see here, the right, the right kind of worship, it can take an offense. Boy, she does. What kind of faith is this that Jesus looks right at her, blasts her, and she says, that's true. I'm done. I've been preaching about some time. Here, I'm fixing to be done right now. 
where the right kind of worship can take offense. The right kind of worship's got the right origin. It's got the right occasion. But lastly, the right kind of worship has the right outcome. <laughs> look, look at the outcome. I love the hound of this. Verse 27, she said, Truth, Lord. Watch what she says. You got to love this. You got the dogs eating the crumbs which fall from the master's table. What's Jesus going to do with that? I mean, y'all, look here. He, he's God in the flesh. That's God. I ain't saying God's ever been stumped, but that's the closest he ever got to it. I ain't saying she stumped him up. She didn't. I don't believe that. But if somebody ever did, that's it. What's he going to do with that? Have mercy on me, O Lord. My daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. He don't say nothing. Nothing. Don't even, don't even acknowledge she's there. Rude. Rude. Keeps on walking. She keeps on crying. He tells the disciples, I ain't messing with that cow. I'm not sitting on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She finally runs down there, jumps right down in front of him where he can't go nowhere and worships him. Lord, help me. He looks at that woman and says, Hey, I'm not sitting with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hey, let me tell you something, honey. It's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. You, you getting this? I mean, just, you know, come on, get out of my way. I got business to tend to. And she says, You're right. But I will tell you, you know the dogs do eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I ain't asking for a loaf. I'm not asking for a slice. I'm not asking for a piece. I think you're God. I think you're God enough. I think you're big enough. I think your table's awesome enough. I think your bread is sufficient enough that if I just got a crumb of it, I, I think it'd be enough. Just, just flick off a crumb. That's all I want. Watch what Jesus says. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, Oh, woman. Oh, woman. Great is thy faith. Y'all know there's only two things in the New Testament that amazed the Lord. There's only two things the Bible said that made the Lord marvel. Just two. Check it out. Check me, see if I'm right. Just two that the Bible said he marveled at. And they're also opposed one from the other. The Bible said that he marvels at great faith and he marvels at great unbelief. Why do these two things amaze the Lord? Well, great faith amazes the Lord because he knows who we are. See, he knows who we are. He knows that we are just little old specks of dirt. Insignificant little old specks of dirt on this dirt ball called earth. And when God looks at uh, our little finite peon brains and human reasoning, and God looks at us and we just throw ourselves totally on Him and trust Him by faith and believe on Him, God says, wow, that's awesome. I know what that guy is. I made him. And to think that guy, whom having not seen me, he still loves me, and all the chips stacked against him, and his flesh is telling him one thing, and the world's telling him one thing, and the devil's telling him one thing, and he still has faith in me, and she still has faith in me. Wow, that's amazing. And on the other hand, great unbelief makes the Lord marvel. Do you know why great unbelief makes the Lord marvel? Not because he knows who we are, but because he knows who he is. And God looks, and when you cannot trust Him, and you cannot believe Him, and you cannot worship Him, even when everything's going wrong, He looks and says... Do you not know who I am? I gave you a book, 66 books, and one book that tells you who I am. I am the God that nothing is too hard for me. Nothing. Nothing. I am the God that said, I'm the same yesterday, today, forever. I'm the God that said, I am the Lord, I change not. I'm the God that told you I'm not a man that I should lie, neither the son of man that I should repent. I am the God that told you that I sat on the throne of heaven and earth is my footstool. Why can't you trust me? Here, little old Gentile woman, she just throws herself on him. I trust you. 
And he says, Oh woman, great is thy faith. I like colon, kind of little pause here, and it just be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Fine, you can have it. You gonna just worship me in spite of the fact that I ignored you, I insulted you, and you keep on worshiping me? In spite of the fact that the devil's still at your house and you still worship me? In spite of the fact that you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, you still worship me? Fine, fine, fine. You can have it. You leave me alone now? Yep, that's all I wanted. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. You say, I really don't like the way that you kind of made the Lord out in that. Why? That's because you're too prideful about who you think you are. He's the king and you ain't nobody. You don't deserve nothing he's got. You don't lay claim to nothing he's got. And you, you think you deserve something. No, you don't. You don't. He's royalty. And to think that God would even just say, all right, here's a crumb. You happy now? Yeah, I'm happy now. Okay, hey, that, that good enough for me. It's got the right outcome. Brother Daniel, would y'all help us over here? Would y'all mind singing that song, Miss Stormy Song? I love that song. Just heard it the other day. Great song. About that, his, his, he's been faithful. I like that. I'm telling you tonight, you say, Preacher, here's the problem with some people. I'm done, Preacher. Here's the problem with some people. They watch folks worship, and they think this. They think, well, if sister so-and-so was going through what I'm going through, she couldn't worship like she worships. If brother so-and-so had it as bad as I got it, he couldn't work. You know what I often find out? This is what I have often found out through a few years of ministry. I find this. Normally it's the people that have it the worst that worship the most. Why is that? Why is it? It seems like it, get rep it gets replicated even in the Old Testament. Israel got to doing too good for too long. You know what they'd do? They'd clam up on God. Know what God would have to do to get them to come back and worship Him? Worship Him? He'd have to bring persecution. He'd have to cut the blessings off. Put them down on the bottom. Then they'd start giving Him glory again. And I find a lot of times when God puts us in those places, that's when we realize our sufficiency is of Him. God, we need You. I wonder, do you think you need Him? Whether you think you do or not, I'm, I'm giving you a news update tonight. You do. And some of the only some of the only balm that can help the healing where you're at is to worship Him. Worship will do one of two things for you. Worship will either fix the situation you're in, and if it don't, fi if God chooses not to fix the situation that you're in, worship will fix you in the situation. Worship will give you the ability to march on through the situation with the hand of God in yours. Wonder on this. I guess second night of meeting. If you'd be willing just to worship Him. Let's invoke Him into the service. Give Him the top spot. Give Him the worship He deserves. Let's all stand tonight. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. God, Your Word is so powerful, quick, sharp. God, it, it digs down to where it divides asunder our soul, our spirit. It discerns our thoughts and our intents. What a book. There's not a book on the planet. There's not one book on the planet, Lord, outside of your word that I could have done tonight what we just did. There's not a book on the planet we could have expounded like this and helped somebody with it. You can't do it. But we thank you for your word. Changes us. Conforms us. Helps us. God, I pray right now that you'd help some dear saint of God to find a little place and, and just worship you. God, may they present their burden, their request, their petition, and worship you along with it. Bless this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.